Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning and welcome to Morning Movie News, where first things first, happy Star Wars Day. Yes, it is May the 4th. So clever, so funny. Uh, and the holiday has taken on new momentum uh, as the franchise has returned you know, with new films that everybody likes. Ah, sorry, I couldn't help myself. Sorry, prequels fans. Uh, we love you too. But anyway, I am wearing my Star Wars shirt in honor of the day, Come to the Dark Side. Sometimes I do think maybe I'd go to the dark side. Although now that you can be a gray Jedi and have it all, I think, uh, who wouldn't pick being a gray Jedi if that's an option? If you don't know what a gray Jedi is, I made a whole video about it, and you should know because it looks like that's what episode uh, eight is going to be about. Uh, and there's a link down below in the video description to learn all about it and whether or not it's a good idea. Uh, so, so anyway, uh, there isn't any Star Wars news to talk about today. I wish there was, or at least there is not yet. Uh, but they did everything for Star Wars Celebration just a couple of, like a week or so ago. So uh, the one thing I can tell you though, is if you wanna be, uh, get into the festivities besides tweeting about it or wearing your Star Wars stuff or buying Star Wars stuff, uh, TBS is airing the movies uh, all day long. They're gonna have a marathon, it's gonna become an annual thing of the, of the six films. They're not including The Force Awakens. Too expensive, couldn't get the rights to that. Oh, um, uh, and I'm sure that they have commercials. So that sucks, but you know, if you wanna watch them, they're on, have them on, the, on in the background. It starts, at si it's, so it's already started. It started at 6.40 a.m. with The Phantom Menace. Uh, then they're gonna go through the whole uh, first six movies and you can watch them all day long uh and it's pretty cool that it takes up all day just with star wars movies so have a fantastic day um and if you go over to my twitter account i have a poll running uh, asking you who you're most excited for in the last jedi which character uh, uh, uh ray finn luke or leia a lot of you are like where's poe where's kylo they only give me four slots for a poll on twitter it's a broken system and so i pick the characters that i think uh, are the most likely to have some, although I do think Kyle, I don't think Poe's gonna get any character development. I don't even know why Poe's there, quite frankly, except to, uh, for, uh, for queer baiting, to be honest with you. Uh, Disney, well, they're, they're getting better. Uh, but Kylo might have some significant growth, so we'll see. But, you know, I, maybe I should have put Kylo instead of Leia, but I wanted to pay my respects to Carrie Fisher. All right, so anyway, let's get on to today's morning movie news. So the first story of the day, uh, sorry, I couldn't cover this yesterday. I was supposed to do morning movie news yesterday, but I had to run out to the King Arthur press screening, which was in the middle of the day, which is tough to, to do, but I want to be able to make the embargo. Uh, and then there were all those trailers that dropped yesterday morning, so I, I couldn't get to morning movie news. I apologize. Uh, even though I got up at 6.30 a.m. and got to work, like it's like 7.45, it just it didn't work out. But anyway, because they debuted um, uh, the Dark Tower trailer so early, although it was beaten into the ground by the Defenders trailer. Oh, that was tough. That was n It seemed like Dark Tower got off to a good start, but it was just schooled so hard by the Defenders. And movies by TV, oh, it was so, it was, it was brutal. But anyway, something I wanted to discuss was that on Tuesday, Josh Gad tweeted out a picture of the penguin quite cryptically. And I had a number of you ask me, oh my God, Grace, is Josh Gad the penguin? Is he trying to tell us something? But you know, the question is, is he trolling? Josh Gad has been having a lot of fun trolling about Star Wars, you know, trying to get Daisy Ridley, his co-star in the Murder in the Orient Express to give him spoilers and us spoilers. Uh, but he did end up being uh, an MC at Star Wars Celebration because, you know, he's a big Disney personality now, so they decided to use him there. And he is a Star Wars fan, legitimately. So maybe this, there is some truth to this. I mean, Josh Gad has never outright trolled. And maybe, though, he's just auditioning. Maybe he's like, eh, come on, Warner Brothers. And if he is, if I were Disney, I'd be like, after I did, after I made you, you would go to Warner Brothers? Ah, uh, all right. But so anyway... I can see the studio logic about this casting, all right? So Warner Brothers might be like, oh, he's pretty hot stuff after Beauty and the Beast, and he is in the upcoming Murder on the Orient Express, which is for Fox, so he doesn't always have to work for Disney. Uh, let's use him, right? So I can see the studio, so, you know, studio logic. Not always the best logic, but sometimes the logic we get. Uh, and then for Gad and his management team, I can see them saying, oh, this is a great way to break away from the lovable, uh, cuddly guy stereotype that you've cultivated uh, 
that, you know, that Disney has kind of like branded you with, right? I mean, he did look kind of evil on the motion poster for Beauty and the Beast, as you might recall, his LeFou. Uh, but, you know, he wasn't evil in the movie. He was adorable. So I don't really know if he could do a good penguin. I think there are shades of Jesse Eisenberg as Lex Luthor here. And that was, I really liked Jesse Eisenberg's performance in the theatrical cut. But then when I watched the Ultimate Edition, he just went full Jesse Eisenberg. And it wasn't good. So I could understand the casting of Jesse Eisenberg, but since it didn't work out, I worry that this would have a similar problem. And I don't really think that Warner Brothers is at a point right now, I don't think they're steady enough that they can take risks like this, to be perfectly honest with you. I also don't know where he would show up. Would he be in Gotham City Sirens? I don't know if you want a bunch of women beating up Josh Gad. That doesn't seem particularly cool, right? <laughs> Started, start, it starts to become a little bit like a pillow fight, right? And Josh Gad is the pillow. Sorry, I couldn't help myself. Uh, although I could see Josh Gad totally having a pillow fight with a bunch of women, right? Um, or he could be the villain in Nightwing or Batgirl. But even there, you know, with him being LeFou, then I could see LGBT undertones with Nightwing, considering, you know, um, the very strong LGBT fan base that Nightwing has. And then with Batgirl, I think he's a weak villain for a female character. I just think he's a weak villain overall. I'm open to being surprised. But again, I feel it's very risky. Uh, and I don't really think that Warner Brothers is in a position to take that kind of risk on. You know, why do it to yourself? So I wouldn't cast him. I also think that, uh, you know, the, the Penguin on Gotham is so popular right now, this goth version of the character, uh, and the very least bisexual, uh, because um, I believe the actor's name is Robin Taylor Lord. Uh, he's just a uh, penguin to me, um, has said that he doesn't, he wouldn't classify his. Uh, Oswald Cobblepot is gay, he's just, you know, open to feelings where they take him and he happened to find himself in a romantic situation with Edward Nigma. Um, that makes total sense. I thought that was very well explained, actually. Uh, but that, that, that version of the character is so popular, um, I would also be concerned about that. However, they do have two flashes going, although I don't know how well that's going for them. People really like the flash on the CW, uh, although I hear this season it's not good. Uh, but still, Again, I don't know why Warner Brothers does this to themselves. They're like, let's create extra problems for ourselves personally instead of just what's already on the table. So, so we'll see. I'm curious. What do you think? Are you like, yes, Josh Gad, be the penguin? Or are you like, hmm? I mean, again, I'm open to being surprised. But I would say if there was any vote at the at Warner Brothers, I don't know if there, maybe there's too many people voting, to be perfectly honest with you. It does very much seem by committee sometimes. But I'd be like, hells no. That's, that's how emphatically I would bet no, I would vote no. All right, so speaking of potentially bad business decisions, the second story of the day is that the Gears of War movie is moving forward, uh, slowly but surely. And a lot of people are excited about that. To, you know, to, you know, to the movie's credit, potential credit, it at least has a lot of interest. And you know, the, the game is played by 45 million people uh, currently. It's a huge hit. It's uh, instrumental in the development of video gaming. So it's like a historic game. And Universal is going to, you know, they're, they're developing it. They're going to distribute it. And Microsoft is involved because they acquired the game in 2014. Underline acquired, because I think that means they don't have the same feeling about it as they do with Halo, which of course has never become a movie because Microsoft wants to be so heavily involved and nobody wants to, nobody in Hollywood is okay with that. So that's why you're getting a Gears of War movie before a Halo movie. So the basic setup is that it's a post-apocalyptic group of commandos fighting a swarm of alien creatures called locusts. And to me, that seems a lot like Edge of Tomorrow. I'm like, oh yeah, I think I've already seen that movie. Uh, but hopefully you'll see this one too. Uh, and Shane Salerno, this is the big development, Shane Salerno has been brought into script, which I think is pretty scary. This is one of those cases where you're like, why? Why would you hire that guy? So let's look at his, um, his, uh, his uh, resume. So he, James Cameron has picked him to do the Avatar sequels, uh, but you know, uh, Rick Jaffa and Amanda Silver are the writing duo that I feel are really going to make that work. They worked on uh, the first two Planet of the Apes movies. They wrote The Relic. Uh, they're uh, really incredible. And they also did something else recently. I forgot what it was. They're incredibly talented screenwriters, particularly when it comes to science. So I think they're going to be the, the, the engine when it comes to the Avatar sequels. I hope they're like fending off Shane Salerno's work because he also wrote that Oliver Stone movie, Savages, you might recall, with Blake Lively. Port and, and, and um, uh, ooh, oh my goodness, so many names today. Uh, the guy from 
John Carter of Mars. I, I can't believe I forgot his name, but he's a great actor, I think, and he just had a bad, bad run, including Savages, by the way. Uh, Aaron Taylor Johnson was in Savages as well. He wrote the first Ghost Rider movie, which I enjoyed, but, you know, I wouldn't think that's going to be my big Gears of War screenwriter. Uh, he wrote, and then he also wrote Alien vs. Predator Requiem. And then he wrote Armageddon, right? Uh, with one of the Gilroy brothers, so that's, the Gilroy's turned out great, but, you know, the Gilroy's even themselves are hit and miss. So, I wouldn't hire Shane Salerno. I, I mean, he has a cool name, but I'd be like, let's just go hire Shane Black. And they're like, well, he's doing Predator. And you're like, damn it, all right, let's get another Shane. Uh, but I, when, I hear the, when I hear Armageddon, I'm like, you know what, let's just hire Michael Bay. If Michael Bay directed Gears of War, I'd be like, at least it's going to look amazing, right? I don't know. I think this seems tough to me. And I think that the video game movies really fall apart when it comes to their scripts. Like, it's so unfortunate what happened with Assassin's Creed. Very high production values. A passion project for Michael Fassbender. He really committed. He produced the film. He was like, I'm going to do this. And it just did not work out. It was actually a really hard movie to sit through. It got really cool at the end. when they, And they do this all the time. They're like, sequel. And you're like, why do you bet on a sequel instead of making sure the first movie is just good? Right? I mean, it's really frustrating. So... I just don't know what it's going to take to get video game movies to work. Uh, they, they want to follow in the footsteps of comic book movies, uh, which of course are doing quite well. Uh, and you know, there's I think there's a, a great narrative here where we transition from comic book movies to video game movies as more and more of you start to say, you know, I need a little bit of a break from comic book movies. There's too many of them. So I think that video game movies are missing a really strong potential opportunity here. And I think that their real problem is their scripts so and then hiring someone like Shane Salerno certainly doesn't help the situation all right so that's the second story of the day I'm curious to how you feel uh, if you're a Gears of War fan uh, uh, what do you think of the potential movie do you think that the script is important uh, is there a good story there uh, and then also if you're not a Gears of War fan do you think you'd see the movie does it sound good to you I mean these movies can only succeed if not only fans go but non fans it has to reach out to a new audience so then the third story of the day is I told you Paris Jackson wants to be an actress and become an actress she is trying to be. She did that big spread recently on Rolling Stone. I said it was very well orchestrated. She looked amazing. And I said, this is the launch of an acting career. Make no mistake about it. Because this is how it's done. And that's how you could tell it's what she was doing. You know, they really did a good job in that Rolling Stone photo shoot, an article to brand her, to, you know, to, to give her a very strong look. And it's paying off. And that she's gotten herself not only an, a, a, an actress, acting gig but a legitimate acting gig so she's already been on Lee Daniels Lee Daniels uh, produced star on Fox you know it's not it's not it's not one of the bigger TV shows but you know it gave her an acting credit but now uh, she's going to appear as, in a, a small role in Amazon Studios' upcoming film by Nash Edgerton. They haven't titled it yet, but Nash Edgerton, yes, he is the brother of Joel Edgerton. And he largely comes from stunt work, right? He directed one film a couple of years ago, like 2008. Uh, so I don't think this is a slam dunk by any means. But Joel Edgerton, I think his directorial debut, The Gift, was pretty good. And Joel Edgerton is going to appear in this as well. And this is an amazing cast. So I think if Nash Edgerton is going to succeed as a director, it would be here. You know, if it doesn't work out, it's totally his fault because all the pieces are aligned quite nicely. So Amazon Studios is distributing, and it's going to star David Oyello, Amanda Seyfried, Charlize Theron, Tandy Newton, and Charlotte Copley. That's pretty good. Um, and now Paris Jackson. Uh, and it's about a businessman in Mexico with criminal dealings. And the question is, and is, is it's, that's going to be David Oyello, by the way. And the question is, is he in over his head? Or is he like Walter White? And he's like a, head, a couple steps ahead of everybody, right? It's your typical ensemble, you know, uh, film noir kind of movie. In the 90s, they used to make these all the time. I think it's interesting because Charlize Theron actually debuted in a film like this, Two Days in the Valley, with James Spader and I think Terry Hatcher, if I, if I recall correctly. And that was the beginning of her career. So Paris Jackson in a smaller role here with Charlize Theron also co-starring kind of reminds me of that. Like it's full circle, right? And I'm sure Paris Jackson would love to be launched on a similar, similar career trajectory. But I think she has the look down beautifully and I think she branded herself quite well. She'll be playing a dark, quirky character, which is exactly how she branded herself. Uh, but let's, now all that remains is whether or not she can act. Did anybody see her on Star? What did you think? Uh, she'll certainly get, I think, some good publicity. You know, right? So that's the thing. This movie helps Paris Jackson get legitimacy as an actress, and it helps this project of getting additional 
coverage for the movie and as a, as a good media talking point, right? Oh, Michael Jackson's daughter is acting in a movie. Here's a picture of her in it. And then everybody talks about the movie. So that's the way the Hollywood machine works. And it, it's, it's, it's an effective machine. It doesn't work all the time, but if it's going to work, this is usually how it's done. So I think it's interesting. It's very rare that we can see this happening as it's happening and acknowledge and recognize that it's happening, right? So you saw the, again, this is the timeline. You saw Paris Jackson disappeared for a while, right? So then she comes back to the spotlight, totally has changed her look, dyed her hair, uh, trim, slimmed down, uh, totally brands herself very strongly on the cover of Rolling Stone. It's an amazing photo shoot. Looks very good, very high concept. Uh, then she gets a small little role in a TV show through Lee Daniels. I'm sure some favors were called in from the Jackson family. Gets herself an acting credit. Then her management team uh, very shrewdly gets her in this Amazon Studios project in a small role that helps everybody. And you know, that's it's the stepping stone. And I think next she would get a full supporting role if this works out. So interesting. All right. So, and again, it's interesting, you know, as I said, I told you that's what she was doing. Um, but I think to her credit, even though it's kind of obvious what she's doing, she's doing it in a likable, professional manner. It's not trying too hard. So that's the trouble with doing that. Sometimes you come across a little Anne Hathaway-like, right? Very unlikable. All right, so let's go to the viewer question of the day, which is a tough question. Uh, this is from Sunder O, who, or Sunder Zero, who asked me yesterday on the Dark Tower trailer, Grace, do you think that having a black man play a white character will hurt this movie like having a white woman play an Asian character hurt Ghost in the Shell? And I have to say, the question gave me pause because I think it's a, it's a legitimate argument. And I think that while it's unfortunate, it would be horrible to see Idris Elba brought down like something like this. Um, it was horrible to see it happen to Scarlett Johansson. Although it's interesting, with Scarlett Johansson, I think there was less sympathy because you were like, why'd you take the role? I mean, it should have been obvious to you. But I think that the problem there was that there's like, oh, there's no shortage of roles for uh, you know white women. Uh, but then with Idris Elba, I think it's a little bit more of a sympathetic situation where you're like, well, what, there aren't a lot of roles for Idris Elba, particularly in big Hollywood productions where he could be the lead. So that's why I think it seems a little different on the surface of it, but when you get right down to it, is it really that different? I mean, it's hard. It's hard to say. I mean, I don't think it's necessarily fair to say that it's not the same situation uh, because, you know, you have a character that was, you know, set a certain way that fans have really become acclimated to with that ethnicity. Uh, and if you change it, is that a problem? It's, it's, it's difficult. I'm not sure. Uh, now, some people will argue that they never specified Roland's ethnicity in the books. And he did actually marry an African, or I don't know what, I don't know where she's from, but a, a black, a black woman. But in the, so while in the books his ethnicity isn't specified, in book covers and in comics it has been specified as Caucasian. And of course Stephen King had to okay that, so it's clearly how he saw the character. Very Clint Eastwood-like usually is how he's, he's uh, depicted. So, I mean, you might say to yourself, oh, well, another white male role, uh, but at the same time, you know, it's a very strong fan base, and that's how they've seen the character, and I don't know, they might decide this isn't my dark tower, which would be really unfortunate. You know, this is very tricky, but again, as I said, it's, it's tough to say, oh, this is horrible, but even though this is the exact same thing, it's not horrible, right? I mean, that's like, again, it's, it's not fair, and so I'm, I'm not, to me, I am not, I'm not into the Dark Tower, uh, and I got, I got into the, also the Ghost in the Shell, I felt it was like cultural appropriation, uh, but at the same, but I mean, and that's, that's a whole different, a, a, a cultural appropriation for a culture that isn't, I think, very well represented, uh, and doesn't get its due, uh, but then you're like, well, Stephen King has so many characters, so why can't we change it? And it worked with Deadshot, for instance, in Suicide Squad, but you know, who's really like, oh, that's not my Deadshot, right? I mean, they had a character that, that really needed to be changed. Although you can see the same thing really hurt Johnny Storm in when um, Michael B. Jordan was cast in the role, but I thought he did a good job. I thought the real problem was that they didn't change the ethnicity of Sue Storm to match since they're supposed to be uh, brother and sister. They had this weird like adoption angle just to, to get away with it, even though they did make uh, their father uh, a black actor as well. I think if they'd just gone by just changing the whole family, it would have worked better. Uh, I thought it was fine. There was some hate against it, but I don't know if that's what it really affected the movie. It's hard to tell why people didn't totally show up. I told you when I went to see Fantastic Four myself, it was largely an African-American audience in my theater, in my, in my movie-going experience. And I thought it was unfortunate that more, a more diverse crowd didn't show up for that film which the first two thirds I thought were pretty darn good. And then it just became absolutely <laughs> horrible. Uh, but so this is a very difficult situation. And I think, you know, I would hate to see something like this happen to Idris Elba, uh, but maybe 
I'll be curious. I'll be curious how Dark Tower fans feel. I saw a lot of Dark Tower fans supportive of this yesterday when the trailer debuted, but the trailer, again, wasn't as hot as the Defenders trailer, which is scary. Uh, and, of course, you know, the movie just has to be good regardless of who they cast in the roles, and that's also, I think, a big question mark still. So I'm curious how you feel about it. Which, I mean, how do you feel, like, emotionally about if, which is right and which is wrong or if both are wrong? Uh, and then how do you feel intellectually? Because I think this is one of those situations where you're like, you know, I might feel emotionally a certain way, but intellectually I have to acknowledge that it is kind of the same situation. So we'll see what happens. It's a really tough discussion, and I'm sure Idris Elba is very tired of having it, and I feel sorry for him. Uh, and I ho just hope that he can at very least use this as a stepping stone to move ahead. Uh, when I said, can he make the jump to movies yesterday, a lot of some people were, some Idris Elba fans, where I understand, were like offended. They were like, he's been in movies for a long time. What are you talking about? But the important thing to remember is he hasn't been starring in successful movies. He's only had like these supportive, like very small supporting roles. Um, you know, he's not a big movie name here. I mean, he's been making movies, but I certainly wouldn't say that he's a movie actor here in, in the United States, especially because a lot of his bigger movies have been just voice role, voiceover roles. So I'm rooting for Idris Elba. I'm a big Idris Elba fan, but I think he's by no means out of the woods just yet. And I would hate to see him get entangled in this sort of situation, uh, like what happened to Scarlett Johansson. And we have yet to see what the ramifications really truly are from that. All right, so that's today's morning movie news. Thank you so much for uh, tuning in. Please write down below what you think today's top three stories. Sunder O's very difficult viewer question. Anything you'd like to see covered tomorrow, and of course, any questions that you might have. Thanks for watching. Bye.